Hello. Welcome, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. We are here at the Penny Hoarders Q&A with Napkin Finance Arthur, Tina Hay. We're so glad to be um, having you all and having Tina here with us. We're so excited to be getting into an interesting um, conversation in just a, a little bit. We're, uh, my name is Nicole Dow. I will be your host for today, and I'm a senior writer here at The Penny Hoarder. And at The Penny Hoarder, our mission is to empower people to make smart choices about their money. Um, I want to welcome Tina again. Tina is the founder and CEO of Napkin Finance. Napkin Finance is a personal finance education platform, and um, they make wonderful use of clever infographics to help people um, teach them about, about all types of money topics. Tina, we're so glad to have you. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here. Awesome. I just wanted to, before we jump into our q and I wanted to um, give our audience a little rundown of, of why we're here today. So last month, we kicked off a virtual book club over in our Penny Quarter community group. And we've been chatting about napkin finance. Napkin finance was our, our first pick of the book club. We've been chatting about um, the book and different topics um, that the book covers. And um, if you are not a member of our Penny Quarter community, I, I strongly urge you to join us. We'll be dropping a link to, the, um, to sign up in the comments. And it's free, it's easy, and it's not just for book club. Um, our Penny Quarter community group covers all types of topics. You can ask your questions about budgeting or getting out of debt or um, getting uh, a second side gig or something like that. Um, we'd love to, to join you and uh, we'd love to, for you to join us over in the Penny Harder community and um, yeah, be engaged in and chat with us. Speaking of being engaged in chatting, um, this event today, we really want to hear from you guys. We want to um, hear about what questions you might have regarding napkin finance or questions you might have for Tina Hay. So to ask a question, just drop that in the comments below. Um, we'll be choosing comments from our audience members or choosing questions from our audience members to ask during this broadcast um, to get Tina's take on, on what you might want to know. And um, as a bonus, we're going to be giving away five copies of Napkin Finance. We'll be giving that those away um, after the broadcast. And in order to uh, enter for a chance to win in the book giveaway, all you have to do is ask a question. So we really encourage you guys to be engaged ask questions um, and let's make this interactive. All right, so without further ado, um, let's jump into this, this Q&A, shall we? Tina, um, again, welcome. Thank you for, for joining us. For those of you who are, are just tuning into the Facebook Live, Tina is the author and CEO of Napkin Finance. Um, Napkin Finance is a personal, education, a personal finance educational platform um, where they make great use of clever infographics to help talk about money, all types of money um, topics. Tina, welcome. Thank you. Of course, we're so glad to have you. Um, so I gave a, a little snapshot about, about Napkin Finance, but I'd love to hear from you. Um, can you tell us about how you founded Napkin Finance and, um, and wrote this book and created the site? Of course. So Napkin Finance visual guide to money and finance we help people understand complex topics in a simplified more digestible ways with snackable content everything from napkins to videos articles storyboards charts tables we also add humor and some fun to the content to make it more engaging and interesting so we have our site napkinfinance.com but we also had our book that came out um, last year napkin finance build your wealth in 30 seconds or less. Um, that has been really fun for us to um, create and also see how it's resonated with so many different people in different stages of their financial education. Awesome. And we've been loving the, the book over in our community group. We've been dropping in some, um, some of the napkins and people have been loving to see the different approach um, to personal finance through a visual form format. Um, speaking of that, can you talk to us about how visuals play in kind of grasping some of these tough um, financial concepts? 
Definitely. So visual learning is a, a classic concept. Mozart, Da Vinci, Freud all use visual images and graphics to solve their biggest problems. And so what we do is we, we realize that people are, human beings are visual learners and they process images 60,000 times faster than they process text. And also 90% of the images that we actually see or information that we process to the brain is visual. So it's very powerful to have the visual content that tells a story around a topic or theme as you see on, on with, the, with the napkins right now. And so visual um, you know, graphics and assets that we create have been really powerful because when we do use them, there's more, especially with money and finance, it's less intimidating, higher comprehension, better retention of the content, and also um, enhanced retrieval. So it's a really powerful combination, but also it just makes it fun for most people who are visual learners like myself and many on our team. Yeah, I think one of the reasons we, we picked this book for our first um, big book club pick was because it, it was different and that um, the infographics are really engaging and it helps you kind of understand, like you can read it and understand, but to see it and understand it, it's a whole different aspect. Um, Definitely. You, you, were, you are a visual learner yourself. Um, how did, I, from what I understand, you um, make use of like actually drawing on a napkin to, to help break down um, some tough financial concepts yourself? Can you give us a little um, more information about how creating the napkins helped you in your, in your personal life? Yeah, so I, I, I mentioned before, you know, I'm a visual learner and I went, actually the, the inspiration was my own struggles. I went to business school, I was at Harvard, but came from a liberal arts background and was sitting with bankers and consultants who, you know, really understood the material and not being a numbers person, I started sketching out different topics. And so what started with one nap, which was compound interest, has now grown into thousands of pieces of content that have resonated with people, um, with many other people. And so still to this day, I think not just around money and finance, but you know, the back of the napkin is a very classic concept of you know drawing things out and in a very simplified way. And it's much harder than it seems to really take a concept and be able to explain it to, you know, they say you don't really understand a topic unless you can explain it to um, a, a six-year-old. So we try to keep that in mind, but also make it fun and and make beautiful graphics at the same time and also highly accurate. So it's, we, you know, we have a big job with each napkin or a piece of content that we produce. Well, I have a six-year-old myself, so I'm gonna have her look through the book and see you get start her uh, financial yeah. education early. <laughs> Exactly. It's never too. It's never too early yeah, to start. You're right about that. Um, can you walk us through how you go about creating a napkin? Yeah. So it's interesting. We have a, So we have a team that's um, a, a mix of creatives and also financial experts. And so what? How we create our content is we start with an article or blog, and then we pull out the top the the elements that are the most interesting or important to include in a napkin. And we distill those into either a napkin or chart table. The napkin comes to life with our designers, and then we create a video or other content based on that. So we really start with the text, and then we start, and then we pull out really the most key elements of understanding a topic that will translate well into visual images. And so, and we go back and forth quite a bit to make sure we get the napkin right. Okay. There are like different iterations of the napkins as you're going through the creative process. We go through so many. I mean, it's it's interesting. Like, you know, it's even very small things. We try to cut out everything that's not necessary and then also make it visually appealing, not make them all, you know, exactly the same, add some variety. Um, but also at the end of the day, the ultimate test is like, if you, you know, if you're new to this topic, would you be able to look at this and understand the topic in 30 seconds or less? Yeah. Um, so yeah, and we our range of napkins. We do everything from the basics, money one hundred and one, to more complicated topics like cryptocurrency and game theory. And so, it's really been fun to see how you know topics become timely right now. We have really a lot of interesting crypto cryptocurrency, um, and then but you know also like markets and volatility and and how people approach that. So it's really interesting to see how, you know, the content can be very relevant depending on what's going on in the yeah. world. 
Yeah. Do you often do you um get requests from from your community or from um, the public on which type of napkins they'd like to see? All the time. We actually are really very responsive to what people um, suggest. So people, we definitely um, take them very seriously because part of what we want to do is create content that is you know, helpful for people. And so we, you know, our readers email us all the time with topics that are interesting. You know, we just received a few the other day about, you know, how, you know, we haven't started these yet, but like, why, why can't the government just print money? And what does that mean? Who pays for, you know, the stimulus um, funds? And, you know, so question, you know, we definitely get questions that are really relevant and really important. And it's exciting for us because we learn from it as well. Yeah. Awesome. I, I know a big part of your platform is uh, financial education. Um, Tina, can you tell us, why do you think it is that people struggle so much with financial literacy? So I think a few reasons. First of all, because most people never learn in school. So, you know, most people get into, you know, or graduate high school, enter into college where they start probably either, you know, having their first credit card or acquiring student loan debt without any um, background or education, which is really dangerous and it can lead to, lead to a vicious cycle. Um, and some people, you know, are lucky enough to have their family teach them or friends. Um, so, and unfortunately that doesn't happen with many people. So, you know, there's a d big difference between the people who are um, educated and understand how they can make their money work for themselves versus the rest who never have the basic understanding and then can get into debt and then pay for it, pay for their decisions later. So it's really a matter of education early, as early as possible, and then empowering people with tools to, to help them make, you know, make their money work for them instead of being a slave to their debt and their, you know, um, the decisions that, you know, they made without any background or knowledge. Yeah, that's so true. Um, we have some questions coming in for the audience that I, I want to get to. Um, Elena asks, how can I convince my young, my young adult kids to start saving for retirement now? I feel like that's um, a so good plug to get the book. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the easiest ways to do that is to set, you know, to, to make things automatic, right? The goal at Napkin Finance is that, you know, the simplest things to do with your money are usually the best things that, you know, best best ways to approach your finances. So if you can automate it early on, um, there's so there are two things to, the, that she can do. One is automate it. So, you know, a certain percentage is taken out from their, you know, allowance or income every month and set aside and transfer it automatically into a retirement account. The second is to show the power of um, time and how it compounds and can really grow money. I mean, the most powerful asset people have when they're young is time. And so if you can show how much money can grow, put aside into retirement accounts or savings or in, in, invested in the market, it can be extremely powerful to see the impact of that. And it makes a really big difference if people start in their 20s versus their 30s and 40s. So really understanding how powerful time and compound interest can be um, when you start early saving for retirement or saving for a home, really depending on whatever your you know financial goals are. Yeah, it's amazing how much like the starting at 25 makes versus starting at 30. Just you think five years, what difference would it make? And it, it adds up. <laughs> definitely, definitely. We, that's why we, you know, when people are younger, it's such a valuable, you know, thing to have the time to, you know, start investing or putting even a little bit aside every month, um, you know, for your financial goals. It can really be impactful when, you know, when they enter like their later years or retirement. Yeah. We have another audience question. This one comes from Smith JD. He asks, um, says, I love napkin finance. When reading this book, I was a little confused by the difference between assets and equity because they seem like this, they're the same thing to me. Could you clarify? Thanks. Yeah. So assets, are, you know, assets in general are anything that has has value. So you can have an asset. Assets can range in everything from, you know, your real estate to cryptocurrency to equity to stocks and bonds. 
um, really any type of assets that you or or product or any type of value that you have and you own can be an asset. Um, so there are a lot of different categories. So that oftentimes we talk about asset allocation. So everyone in their portfolio can allocate their money and their savings into different assets, which balance each other out. As we've seen when, you know, the markets are unstable, you can have less, you know, ideally not all of your money invested in one asset class like stocks and equities. Um, and you can balance it out with other asset classes. Um, equity is typically the referred to as the percentage of ownership that you you have personally. So equity, we think of it in whether in a company or stock is a percentage ownership. So it's a it's a different way of thinking about your what your um, your investment is. So you can own. Um, equity within a company, you can own equity within your home, um, but the asset, the different assets are the either the securities or real assets or depending on whatever is, you know, um, it can really range. Great. I love these audience questions. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, especially the folks who might be just tuning in um, here at this Q&A with Tina Hay, we want to make sure um, to hear from you. So please drop your questions in. And if you do drop questions in, we're going to be entering those folks into a giveaway at the end of this broadcast for a chance to win a, a book, uh, a copy of Napkin Finance. So please ask away. Um, uh, we kind of talked about how napkin finance covers, you know, a wide range of, of personal finance topics. Do you have a favorite personal finance topic that um, like really interests you? So I, you know, I actually, I'm really fascinated by, you know, investing, especially in the stock market. I think it's really has been interesting to see what has been going on over time and how people respond to market kind of volatility. Um, so learning about investing and, and understanding like the long-term implications, not just the short term, and also the um, kind of the psychology that is involved in keeping your emotions outside of your investments is really something that we think about a lot because we deal a lot with behavioral finance and how people um, you know, approach their finances. It's so personal and it's so much of it is based on how we grew up, how our parents taught us about our money and finances. And so I think investing and, and the way we approach our finances is a reflection of our character, um, the conditioning and the context that we've grown up with. So I'm always fascinated with learning more about, you know, the markets and, you know, how people can really participate and have an impact and make, you know, make better decisions without um, bringing in their emotions into the game. Yeah, I love that you um, brought that up, how, you know, we as human beings, we use, we're, we're humans, so we're gonna bring in our, our backgrounds and our uh, thoughts about money into how we manage our money and, and how we invest, whether we wanna, um, are more prone to risk or we're less averse or more averse to risk, um, it all plays a part in our money stories. Yeah, and it's so interesting you watch CNBC and you watch, you know, you know, you follow the markets, the more you realize, number one, no one can predict what's going to happen in the markets. No one knows. Number two, oftentimes, you know, the smartest strategies are long term strategies and not the short term kind of day trading that most people shouldn't be doing anyways. Most people are, don't have enough time to research and really understand the decisions that they're making. And so it's just fascinating, but I think it's a beautiful thing that people have access to. So, you know, especially with technology today, access to trading with very low fees and the opportunity to learn about investing and how to grow their money. Yeah, it's great that it's accessible for, for a lot of people. Um, I'm going to jump into a couple more um, audience questions. We have one from Crystal who asks, who says, as a single parent going through the pandemic, how can you rebuild credit um, and rebuild savings successfully and efficient, effectively? So that's a great question. I think it's a few things. The pandemic has showed us that, you know, traditionally we always say you need three to six months of emergency savings. The pandemic has shown that it really 
people really need to save have a year's worth of savings for emergencies, which is considerable and not not an easy thing to do. But I think what what is important is to always follow kind of the budget. The the we suggest a a 50 30 20 budget to start putting money aside even if it's a little you know small amounts as early as possible and to kind of understand where your money's coming in and where it's going out and we have we have a section on budgeting on our website and in the book and to kind of have a plan in place is the best way to to reach those long term goals and i think one really important thing is that you know no matter what you know monthly income is it's to set aside a certain percentage for these financial goals, which is emergency savings and other retirement savings and things like that, as soon as you can. And again, the you know the last year has not been a typical time period. I mean, many people have had to um, you know you know tap into their retirement savings, which is totally fine. But I think we're at a point where people are resetting and then committing to a budget and a plan. And that's a, it's a great thing to share with, you know, children right now because they can start very young and you can make it very simple as just simple as putting it into different buckets and committing to that over the long term. Speaking of um, getting kids kind of started early, we have another audience question. Um, Alina asks, how do I start a fund for my child? And I believe this is in regards to investing, she asked, um, can my child invest in the stock market? How old does a person have to be to invest? Sure, so I think it's, it's children, there, there, well, there are a couple of things. I think you can actually open up a custodial account uh, where you can manage the funds. And there are actually a few sites and, and um, that allow you to do that. I think, I, I'm pretty sure most of the brokerages do allow you to have a custodial account to have your children um, start investing which i think is a great idea just because then it's you can also manage what they're doing and then help teach them along the way so um and then also you know you can also start saving for their um, education through a 529 plan so there are different ways of helping kids start saving and investing um early on but one one of the things i think is great is to give them empower them to learn and then show them again as we talked about before how the markets work, you know, how, you know, over time, you know, you can lose a lot of money. We've been in a bull market. So it's, it's, a you know, this isn't a typical time, but um, to show, you know, the power of kind of, you know, how uh, investing can be really impactful, you know, when you make money and also when you lose money. So it's a great lesson for kids to learn early on. And there are a lot of fun ways to get them engaged. They can invest in companies that they care about or that they're interested in or they use. Yes, I believe there's also um, um, like gamification in um, where you're kind of like doing a mock uh, investing with your, your kid. Um, I can't recall any off the top of my head, but I, I remember um, as like an introduction to the stock market, there are different like games that are mm -hmm. centered around that. Right, right. And I think now everything is gamified I and mean, Robin Hood is gamified. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, just, I think it's, it's a great education into investing and the earlier you can start, the better. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to, to talk about, change the course a little bit. Um, I loved in the book how there are a lot of different interesting fun facts and um, like little known things that, that are sprinkled in throughout. I want to read one that really stuck out to me. Um, this was part of the student loan section and said at more than 1.5 trillion dollars if american student loans were a country they would be the 13th largest economy in the world roughly the size of australia <laughs> like that was just blew my mind like that's a lot of student loan debt <laughs> um how did you come across all the different like fun facts and, and little known facts like um did yeah. you what was your most interesting thing that you've learned you know there's so Fun facts. We have it in our book and on our site. We always include fun facts. Um, I mean, there are so many. We have, you know, one interesting fact is as related to investing over a twenty period, uh, twenty year period, stocks never lose value. So if you're investing in the long term, you're not going to be losing money, which is, you know, an interesting observation. Um, but the way we structure kind of the content is, and especially in the book, we have um, we have the napkin, we have a short article, we have quotes, we have fun facts, and then. We actually have comedians that write for us and help us kind of come up with these um, 
these like one-liners we call them that are kind of like fun sayings and things. I, I can read a couple as well and they just kind of add some humor and lightness to a topic. So um, one example, the topic is recessions is um, with careful planning, hard work and sharing a Netflix account with five other people, you can bounce back from a recession. <laughs> They're, they're supposed to be cute and kind of fun. Another one is um, um, how to start a startup. You know, we talk about entrepreneurship. And so we say some successful entrepreneurs include Oprah, Jeff Bezos, and the clever Girl Scouts selling cookies outside weed dispensaries. So, <laughs> so they're meant to be fun and, you know, again, break things up a little bit and make the content more interesting and, uh, and yeah. fun to yeah, I feel like some so much of so many of us um kind of shy away from learning about money and finance because it seems stuffy and boring, but it's always like once you can incorporate humor and um like interesting visuals, that kind of just makes it more makes you more um wanting to learn more about money. Right, right. Exactly. So yeah, we try to again add a kind of the fun aspect to make it more interesting and especially you know our whole brand is about being relatable and we want people to you know enjoy learning and also you know have it be more accessible and digestible so the the humor is definitely definitely helpful wonderful um you know when it comes to your your own um kind of financial upbringing um what would you say is the best piece of personal finance advice you've ever received? So I have three pieces of advice that I I believe are really um, kind of the most impactful, very simple. Um, but the first one is um, diversify. So don't have all your eggs in one basket. The second is keep costs low. So one of the things that people don't realize are all the fees that we pay for, whether it's advisors, financial products, mutual funds, sometimes people don't realize a lot of their um, their the, the the money their investments are getting eaten up by these fees um, and then the third one is buy and hold so I'm a big believer in investing for the long run um, it's been proven over and over you know a lot of people who take out their money when there's a dip in the market also miss the upside so you know we saw it over this last year the people who pulled out their money in last March April, um, waiting for the market to go back up, but then missing the, you know, the quick rebound, um, miss the opportunity to watch their money kind of grow or bounce back with the market. And so one of the things and, and you know, that, that that's been proven over and over is the most, um, the most solid and most um, reliable strategy is really to buy and hold. And most people shouldn't be day traders and, and aren't trained to be. And, you know, we've been in a bull market. They always say like everyone in a bull market is a genius because most people have made money regardless of where they've put it, but that can quickly change. And, you know, and we've seen that over the years that, um, you know, you know, you can, you can invest in, you know, really fundamental kind of, you know, indexes and things like that, low fee um, investing and, and you can do really well in the long run and it can provide stability and, and, um, and really, again, bounce back with the market. Okay. We have a, a couple more audience questions that have come in. Um, Gail asks, how do I know if it makes sense to convert a regular 401k to a Roth 401k? Yeah, so we're big fans of Roth 401ks, and it really depends. I would I would talk to your accountant. It depends on your tax rate, right? The benefit of a Roth is that you know you put it post tax um, money into the account, and it can grow that way, um, which can be really. And it depends again what if your tax rate is going to be increasing over the year. So I would talk to your accountant, but overall, we generally believe that Roth IRAs are the better route but again we don't give financial advice so um, ideally you can speak to your financial advisor but again one of the important things is how much are you paying in fees for managing your 401k most people don't even know that so i would find out about that as well I have a, uh, another retirement related question um donna asked do you have advice for transitioning from full-time employment to retirement yeah so and again it's so specific to your, again, what you, you know, 
what your um, time horizon, uh, what your investments are, what you have saved up for retirement. Most people have not saved up adequate money for their retirement or depending on social security, which is, you know, no one even knows if it will be there in the next 20, 30 years. Um, so it get, again, it really depends what, to make that transition when you are secure that you'll have, um, you know, from your retirement benefits enough income to have the same lifestyle that you've had um, while working full time. Yeah. And again, if you, I know we can't go back in time, but for um, those of us who are just kind of, um, or those out there watching who are just starting, um, starting in the job market, that this is why it's key to start investing early, to start um, contributing to your 401k early. You want to be able to get to your target retirement age and, and have that money um, so that it will carry you on. And I'll also add to 401ks, if your company provides matching to make sure to take advantage of that, yeah. you'd be surprised how many people don't. Um, again, it's really, it's, it, and again, it's many times benefits are not really explained to people when they start jobs. But if you have a company match, I try to maximize that. And also, I'll, the other thing I'll say is, you know, we work with a lot of financial experts and advisors, and many of them make a lot of the same mistakes the rest of us do. And so not to really worry about what's happened in the past, but to be proactive in the future and know that there is no perfect way to handle your finances. Um, even if you're saving later in life or investing later, um, it, it's okay because most people are, are not doing everything they should or could. And, and that's just the way it is because it's so unpredictable as well. And everyone's lifestyle is different and everyone's short-term and long-term goals are very different. Yeah. There's no like one clear cut answer when it comes to money. It really depends on your individual situation. It's so specific, yeah. And so, and things change, you know, we, we notice that when people go through life events like marriage, birth, divorce, you know, inheritance, you know, the situ situations change as well, which is when people are really looking for those answers. And so it's really good to have someone you can, do, you know, you can depend on and can, can give you, you know, really um, relevant answers, but also, mm -hmm making sure that you're not, um, you know, you're not stuck in these products and services that a lot of advisors will sell you um, where they make a large commission and fees and you don't, you know, most people don't realize that. Okay. Well, I wanted to get to one last question before we wrap things up and jump into our book giveaway. Um, you know, what do you hope that people get out of reading napkin finance? So we, the, the beauty of the book is I think it's really comprehensive. It covers so many areas within money and finance. So everything from taxes to retirement, credit. What we hope is that this is, you know, a way for people to engage and just get more interested in learning about money and use it as an opportunity to kind of have discussions with either their families or kids or, um, and be proactive and understand that you don't, number one, you don't need a lot of money to make money or to be investing. And number two, that, you know, financial decisions impact every aspect of your life. And so it's really critical to empower yourself with education and knowledge and also your family to make really important decisions. As we've seen, life is unpredictable, finances are unpredictable. And the only thing you can do is make the decisions with the information you have and be prepared um, when, you know, life comes at you with different circumstances. Yeah, that's why it's, it's very important to arm yourself with that information and um, mapping finance is a great source for people to become more educated about their finances. Um, Thank you, yes. Now we, um, let's jump into this book giveaway. We have, oh, I want to thank everyone for participating and for asking such awesome questions. Um, we're going to be announcing five winners, and for those of you whose name I call, um, just be on the lookout for some for future communication from our, our staff. We're going to get in touch so that we get um, your contact information and we get the books out to you. All right, so our winners of today's book giveaway are Alina Gilmer, Elena Thomas Carland, Smith J.D., Crystal Dandiva Nismith and Gail Gleising. Congrats, everyone. 
Thank you so much for asking questions and participating in, in this discussion. Um, we definitely appreciate you. Tina, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you as well. And um, thank you for, for answering all our, our money questions today. It's such a pleasure. And I want to thank everyone for, if, for, um, for buying the book. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to email um, Tina at napkinfinance.com or we have a lot of um, great resources on our website, including free courses on everything from investing to the stock market. Awesome. And that website is napkinfinance.com. Um, you can also check us out at thepennyhoarder.com for more uh, personal finance advice. Please sign up to join our community if you're not already a community member. Again, we'll be having that link in the comments so that you can um, join us and chat about all things money related in the Penny Hoarder community. Well, thank you all again. Um, we're hoping to have more virtual events like this in the future. So we hope this is not goodbye, but just see you later. So enjoy the rest of your day. See you later and thanks.